In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Preserve us from eternal damnation. These are words from the canon of the Mass just before the consecration. And these words are useful today. Preserve us from eternal damnation because this is the Sunday that we start to consider the soul as maybe not responding to God's grace. You see, this whole time after Pentecost, which is 24 to 26 Sundays long or whatever it is, is really a study of the human soul. We've done our study of our Lord Jesus Christ from Advent all the way to Pentecost, and now we study how is this life of our Lord inserted or implemented in our own lives. And uh, we've been hearing the last two or three Sundays now how St. Paul has been telling us, be careful of trying to be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. Be careful of going back to your old vices, which you used to have before you were Christians, and of which you are now ashamed. Be careful, it's in the words of our Lord, he was saying that no man can um, uh, mix friendship with this world with friendship with God. He did say last week, our Lord did, uh, make friends of the mammon of iniquity, but what he meant by that was, if you have riches, use them in order to give alms. If you have gifts or talents or things in this world, use them in order to give glory to God. So that one day, these people for whom you're making the alms, or these people who are benefiting from all of your good works, and your merits and your uh, fruits of the work that you gain, these people will receive you into everlasting dwellings. So this is our Lord's way of saying, don't use the riches of this world in order to just sort of get yourself more attached to this world. Rather, use these riches in order to gain grace in heaven. So this is all very encouraging the last two or three weeks we've been hearing in the epistle and the gospel. But today we actually receive a message which says to us, now be careful, because if you don't do that, it will be unfortunate, as happened with my own city, Jerusalem, would our Lord, our Lord would say it that way. This is the story that, this is the Sunday, that we see our Lord entering into Jer Jerusalem just a few days before he's going to be sacrificed. He is weeping for them as he overlooks the city from the top of Mount Olivet, and he descends into the city, and saying, O Jerusalem, if only you knew what would bring you peace, but it is hidden from you. He's saying, if only you knew all the good that I would like to give you, all the good that I have given to you, you would respond, and you in turn would do works of grace or supernatural works. But it seems like, ultimately, you do not want me. You do not want my life of grace. And this is an unfortunate thing, because that means this is going to be the end of your city. So he was lamenting because of Jerusalem's unfaithfulness to God. He prophesied that the whole city would be destroyed because of its infidelity. Uh, the year was 33, when our Lord was sacrificed and rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. And it would be 40 more years until uh, the Romans would destroy the city of Jerusalem and especially the temple, unfortunately. But um, this is not just a lesson for them. Uh, we know that they knew very well this time was coming based on our Lord's words. You can reflect a little bit on the eighth uh, station of the cross. The women of Jerusalem weep over Jesus. And he says to me, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. What he means is, all of this is going to come to an end. You haven't known the time of your visitation, meaning you haven't recognized the Messiah when he came to you. You haven't responded to his words or to his example or to the merits of his work in order works in order to Reform your lives. You haven't done that. And because of that, the whole city is going to have to be destroyed. Well, the church and our Lord Jesus Christ are telling us that Christian, or dear Christian, this is for you also. 
maybe we're not going to see our church destroyed. It's been 2,000 years, and Catholics have not seen their church destroyed. Our Lord has said that he will be with his church until the end of the world. Uh, but on a different scale, it's an examination of our own souls. We are baptized Christians. We are baptized into uh, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that our life as a Christian and as a Catholic is supposed to be the continuation of his life and the continuation of his sacrifice. And when it comes to following the commandments, which are rather ba basic and really not that hard to follow, sometimes they are very hard to follow, but uh, when we look at the commandments and think that now we must follow these, some people don't want to make the sacrifice. And so they end up with one commandment or two commandments or three, who knows how many, that they just sort of make a compromise on them for themselves and then observe the other seven or eight or however it may be, however many it may be. And this is a problem of the people of God not knowing the day of their visitation, meaning we have the baptism, we've been, uh, we share in the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ because of the baptism, we have communion, we have confession, we have the means of grace all around us, and we are benefiting from them. We receive, we're receiving them, and we're improving our lives because of them. But if we decide to sort of not respond to the grace which God is sending us through these sacraments, or if we decide to say, yes, I respond to the grace of God, and I follow all of these commandments except for this one or two or whatever it may be, that's an unfortunate thing. That would be very similar to the people of God who are supposed to respond to his life, his holiness, the merits and fruits of his actions, and they're not doing it. And so at the end of the day, that meant for the people of God that their city would be destroyed. Now I know that's a huge destruction. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people that were killed. Uh, but in a certain sense, that's just sort of a physical image of the much greater reality when we consider a soul living in the time of the redemption, living in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because what you have there when the city is destroyed and thousands of people die, uh, that's a, a physical loss of life, which is the result of God's own people not receiving him. But if you transfer to our day and age, or you know, to now, 2,000 years later, or even at the beginning of the Christian period, if you transfer to the Christian time, uh, just any soul that has been given this um, gift of supernatural life from our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the results of his death on the cross, his sacrifice of himself, any soul which has been given baptism, and then nurtured with receiving the faith, the catechism, and then given confession, chance to uh, confess and forgive their sins, and then given the whole life of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Communion, and then over and over and over again, those same graces. Any soul living in this supernatural state and then renouncing it? Well, I, in a way, it's worse than the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem because we're talking about a supernatural reality. In a way, and also in a way, if you consider the right distinctions, it's worse than the thousands of deaths of those people of the Israelite nation because they were unfaithful to their own God. Because that's, well, human death. But a soul which has all of his grace, baptism, confession, communion, mass, rosaries, sacrifices, a soul which has all of his grace and then says, but it's not that important to me. Maybe they don't actually enunciate or enunciate the words, but <clears throat> that thought is lurking there somewhere. But it's not that important to me. I still have a right to be a friend of the world. I still have a right to a few, um, you know, satisfactions of one kind or another myself. And, and, they, and they renounce, they, they forfeit, they give up all of that supernatural life that they had in their soul. And this is the destruction of Jerusalem again but in a much worse way. As St. Paul says, and sorry, I don't remember the reference, 
St. Paul says, um, these people who have received the life of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have been bonded or grafted onto the tree of supernatural life, and have received the incarnate God in their soul, and have been unfaithful to him, these people crucify Christ again and make of him a mockery. Those are the words of St. Paul. St. Augustine embellishes on that theme, and he says, uh, be careful of grace passing one time and not passing again. And also, if you have been a son of grace, you've been a child of grace, a child of life, the supernatural life of God, and you've renounced it for one reason or another, but I'm, I mean renounced it in a big way. I'm not just talking about an accidental sin or something that happens by surprise or whatever, but renounced the life of grace in a very physical and meaningful way. You really meant to do it. Uh, St. Augustine says it's much harder to start up the second time than it was the first time. And that would be just plain old basic whatever, um, law of thermodynamics or something like that. It, if you start up and you have enthusiasm, and then you sort of say, well, this isn't that important to me, it's much harder to start up again because you've got the start plus the compromise, and now you've got to get yourself all enthused again. And that's very hard to do. Very hard to do. But these are lessons for us. You know, we, um, we read these stories of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I think we have a tendency sometimes to say, well, those are the bad guys, our Lord was the good guys, and um, uh, he, um, he overcame them, he vanquished them, and, and we're all grateful as a result. We sort of hold the stories of the gospel at a distance from ourselves, saying, that was a lesson for them, and those were the bad guys, and I'm glad our Lord taught them a lesson. Well, no. The reason that Holy Mother Church puts these stories before us so regularly is so that you and I can see that, all right, maybe they were the bad guys. But how many times in my own life, or in our own lives, we've behaved the same way, not knowing the hour of our visitation, not accepting the visit of our Lord Jesus Christ, not accepting the grace and the merits and the fruits of his sacrifice, which he wished to share with us. <laughs> we all have that. Maybe we haven't um, said anything or thought anything in, like, in, a, um, in a final sort of way, I reject Jesus Christ. Maybe everything we have in our sort of our, our bad folder is just sort of accidents and I didn't mean to do it and I didn't know it was that serious, etc. But I don't reject Jesus Christ, you see. But we still have to think of the reality, the spiritual reality of our actions. If the baptism was a complete renunciation of the world, and now saying that since the baptism, I'm only going to live unto Christ, then what would, be, what would sin be? Venial sin, yes, but especially mortal sin. What would mortal sin be? It's saying, I don't want the supernatural life of Jesus Christ. And that's why before we... Um, just before the consecration in the canon of the Mass, we say, preserve us from eternal damnation. That's not a prayer which means um, there are outside influences of evil that wish to overcome me so that I will um, not live to Christ and not be sanctified and not go to heaven. It might be some of that, or that might be some of it, but the reality is that preserve us from eternal damnation a lot of times means preserve me from myself because I wish to compromise with the world. Because I don't wish to give my life complete to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because I wish to have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, this world for myself. Uh, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. So the question may be asked, what moral does the church wish to inculcate by retelling this incident of our Lord descending the Mount Olivet. It would not be, not be truths or mysteries related to the Passion, since we're not in the Lenten season. No, the Church, looking deeply into the heart of Christ, knows that her founder wept because of another reason. Jerusalem, the chosen city, the city that because of its temple became the dwelling place of God himself, 
was a type and image of the soul. Through baptism and Holy Communion, the soul has become the temple of God, the city of the divine King Christ, a city richly blessed, but which through sin does not know what really would bring it peace. The Church wants us to meditate on this event now because Jerusalem is the chosen city and it is beautiful. But in fact, it is the type of our soul. The soul is the chosen city. We are the chosen city. And it is beautiful ever since we've been baptized. But through sin, the soul does not know what really would bring it peace. Our Lord also asks, as says in a different way, a very touching comparison. He says, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered you under my wing like a mother hen does to her chicks? But you would not. Would as in you were not willing. You don't want it. You prefer to have this world. And because of that, I can't, ha I can't have you with myself anymore. And you force me to put a distance between us. The soul looks for things outside of grace that have nothing to do with grace's calling. The sanctified Christian that divorces himself from God through mortal sin resembles Jerusalem, the city that proceeded to crucify its Savior and King. As we said, St. Paul says, those who fall away crucify again to themselves the Son of God. With this in mind, we can understand the church's warning and admonition given in all seriousness. The church tells us, even the baptized soul, the soul blessed with sanctifying grace, may perish eternally. Even the elect may go to hell. If the temple of your soul has become a hangout for thieves through sin, permit your Lord to drive out those traitors, traitors, those who trade in money, not those who betray their country, to permit your Lord to drive out those traitors with the lash of his scourge. That's the second part of the gospel today where our Lord uh, casts out the money changers from the temple. That temple, again, it stands for your soul. If you let the world in there, let our Lord ch chase out those money changers, those traitors, with his scourge. And that would be any kind of unfortunate event or something that stings a little or hurts us but we know that it is our Lord separating us from the world so we can be completely and only united to him this is what our soul needs if the soul commits mortal sin it by its own will divorces itself from God it resembles Jerusalem the city that proceeded to crucify its Savior and King there's only about one week between the time that our Lord descends Mount Olivet and the day that he will be crucified by these people. For our Lord, it all makes perfect sense. Sure, it's his own people against him, but the reality is I am the victim that's being sacrificed for the redemption of these people. That's the only thing that he sees. The church tells us very clearly, even the baptized soul, the soul blessed with sanctifying grace, may perish eternally. Permit your Lord to drive out those intruders in your soul with the lash of his scourge. That is to say, our Lord can be violent with our souls to bring them back to grace. Respond to his grace by making a good confession and live in his love. That's not some sort of a sentimental expression, live in his love. It means live by his grace, live by his commandments live by his good example of sacrifice. That's to live in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what will bring us peace. We have the, the parable that our Lord tells just after the parable of the, the, um, the shepherd that goes out to save the one sheep, leaving the other 99 behind. He tells the parable of a woman who's lost a coin. And she's very upset about this. this. It's just a coin. Not even a dollar bill or a denarium or whatever they had back then. Talents. Just um, drachma, tiny little thing. And she does not rest until she finds that drachma. And she moves all the furniture, furniture and completely turns the house upside down in order to find that little coin. 
And then when she finds it, she invites all of her guests, all of her neighbors and friends to come and re have them rejoice with her because she's found this lost little coin. That's our soul. Our Lord really cares about it. Um, and he will do anything to recover that coin. Turning the house upside down. He'll turn our soul upside down to get the mortal sin out of it. Uh, he does not want us to perish eternally. And you know, we may not think about this very often because we get a little comfortable with religion, or you know, regular in its practice, which is good. But sometimes we have to think about how shocking are the realities of it all. We know that there, there are billions of people on the earth at this time. We know that there have been millions of Catholics throughout history, and there's probably going to be millions more. So we might start to think, well, how big of a deal is it to God whether I do well, I'm practicing virtue or practicing, practicing vice. If I'm doing some great thing for God, people have done things a thousand times greater than me in, in their lives than I'll ever do in my life and in the future as well. So how good, you know, how important is to God my good life and my good actions? And on the contrary side, how important is to God my bad life and my bad actions? He's seen it before. I can't do anything that will shock him anymore. Um, the answer is, don't think like a human being. Think like God. Every soul is a certain facet of his glory. It's like um, a diamond. But it's got millions and millions and millions of facets to it. And each Christian soul is meant to reflect God, God's glory, in its own particular way. And in a certain sense, we don't have a right to lose our soul. We have an obligation to give that soul back to God from where it came, from whence it came. And um, it's very important to him. God wants, God deserves to receive all the glory possible. And that's in the hands of you and me to make sure that God receives all the glory possible. And it makes a big difference to him. And our Lord Jesus Christ, since he's the one that is sent in order to work the redemption, and then bring all souls back to his father, that makes a very big, that's a very big deal for him to make sure that we go back to God the Father. He takes, in a very good sense, huh? He takes great pride in that, meaning he's won this victory for his father through his crucifixion and through the life of grace. We have an obligation to go back to God. It's very important to him. It gives him, gives him great joy and great glory, each and every one of us. We all have an obligation to have a very holy life, and we all have a, it's all very serious if anyone, any of us decides to say, well, my life can't be that important for God, even so therefore sin is not that big of a deal. We can't think that way. First of all, it's not the truth. And secondly, we'll be robbing, you know, defrauding God of the glory that he deserves. So our Lord weeps over Jerusalem. That mean he, means he weeps over our soul. If ever we should sort of uh, adopt this way of behaving, which is um, I'm not going to receive of the grace of Jesus anymore. And then the other side of it, if we insist on having mortal sin in the soul, pray that our Lord drive out these money changers from your temple, from your soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.